my name is Palma Accardi and you are watching Tidal Flooding Talk. We are live at the Irish Pub in Atlantic City and brought to you by the New Jersey Coastal Coalition. Uh, before I introduce my guests, I want to congratulate Dan and Amanda Skeldon. They just had their baby. For everyone that guessed that it was a girl, you are correct. Kenzie Jane came uh, last night. So congratulations, Dan and Amanda. And tonight our special guest is Atlantic City Fire Chief Scott Evans. Good to have you here. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Father. It's good to be here. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became the fire chief? Uh, sure. Uh, I've been an Atlantic City firefighter for over 30 years. Um, I've risen, uh, have risen through the ranks. Um, kind of early in my career, I, I made captain when I was uh, eight years on the job, and, okay. and I was uh, fortunate enough to make battalion chief uh, with 11 years on the job. How long do those positions usually take to obtain? It all depends on timing. It's, it, it's attrition and, and being able to do well on, on the promotional exams, which I've always been able to do pretty good, at least good enough to get me promoted um, through each, each series of tests. So um, being a battalion chief for several years and then uh, eventually making deputy chief for, for a couple years. Uh, and then it, within the last, it was ninth, it was, uh, June of 2016 is when I got promoted to fire chief. So I've been fire chief almost three years. Wow. How do you feel? Do you like well, it? it's it's a challenging job. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, Atlantic City experience has been experiencing lots of changes. Uh, the, the city itself is, is reinventing itself. It's evolving. So, uh, you know, municipal government and fire department emergency services are... Uh, you know, changing with, uh, with the city as the city reinvents itself. So we, yeah. we've had a series and set of challenges in front of us, but uh, you know, we're ready for the challenges and we're here to keep the city safe. Good. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in particular that's new and exciting in Atlantic City? Well, we have uh, lots of things uh, coming on the horizon. I mean, first of all, let's uh, you know, congratulate the Atlantic City Blackjacks, the, uh, the Arena Football League. Um, that's here in Atlantic City. We're, we're very happy to, uh, to be here to support uh, a new football team, so uh, we're, we're good. Um, some new things happening. There's uh, new developments going on. We're happy the Stockton's here. The, uh, you know, obviously, the new casinos that opened last year, we're, we're excited about that. The Orange Loop, uh, we're excited with the new businesses on Tennessee Avenue and New York Avenue. So the city itself is, um, is, is as it reinvents itself, there's, there's new, you know, vibrant areas in the city that, uh, that are happening. So, um, and as we experience a lot of these new activities, the public safety, uh, the emergency services in Atlantic City are, are always looking to, um, you know, the best ways to, uh, to protect the public and respond to, to these new things happening. Now with these new places opening, such as Stockton and the other arenas that you were mentioning. Do you have? Does your department have to do like a drill for with those new places well, every time? Or what we what we look for is for each of these new, um, if you will, these these new businesses that come here that they are prepared to deal with emergencies. Um, and let's just talk about Stockton, for for example. Um, Stockton is very good for planning for emergencies. They uh, they when they came in here. Uh, one of the first discussions we've had, we've had several meetings with their emergency management people, um, that we ask uh, the company, what is your plan? Uh, what do you plan to do in an emergency? Or do you have a plan? So, uh, you know, most companies really are like, okay, well, what are you talking about? So we have to explain it further. Stockton came in with a plan, you know, because they have, they, they, they've experienced, um, they've been in business for a long time and, and being a, a state college, uh, um, they have resources for them, they're available to them. So uh, one of the first things we says, okay, well, if we get a hurricane, comes up the coast, uh, you, know, you have 535 students living literally on the beach. Uh, their dormitories are right on the boardwalk. So our discussions were okay, so uh, you know, how are we going to you know, notify and, and alert your students and then um, evacuate your students and, and where are they going to go? So um, yes, they, they stopped and came. Um, into town and, and they were prepared. That's great to hear. Now, so you were a firefighter at the time of Superstorm Sandy. Yes. Could you walk us through that a little bit? Yes. Um, in, in addition to being a, a firefighter here in Atlantic City, I'm also a member of New Jersey's Urban Search and Rescue Team, uh, which is a, a statewide resource that responds to uh, 
large scale emergencies. When an when a emergency or disaster hits a community and they can no longer support that event, they call for help. And we're equipped to, to handle um, responding to floods, uh, as well as whether it's a building collapse or uh, if it's something special uh, that would require wide area searches. We have canine dogs, we have special search cameras, we have uh, 19 boats that would respond for a major an area that if, they, if a dam would break or a river crest, uh, we could respond and assist the community. So during Superstorm Sandy, uh, prior to Superstorm Sandy, I had experienced uh, several floods in North Jersey. Uh, we had responded to Patterson um, after the, uh, I think it was 2010, 2010 and 2011. The 2010 was heavy snow and heavy rain in the north, up in, I'm talking in Vermont, uh, Vermont and Hampshire area. What happens is the water funnels all down through Jersey, all down through the Passaic River, they call it the Passaic Water Basin. So uh, they experienced heavy flooding in, in 2010. And um, I was um, you know, fortunate or unfortunate, if you will, to respond there for four days, uh, wow. assisting the city of Patterson. Uh, with, they were inundated with five, six, in some areas, seven feet of water in some of their downtown areas. And then again in 2011, it was uh, Irene. Hurricane Irene came up through the center of Jersey. Uh, if you remember, we were all worried about it hitting the coast, and it, it turned in off of North Carolina and came right up through the center of Jersey and created an enormous amount of, of rain. Um, which again filled up that North Jersey Passaic water basin, which again Patterson was um, right in the crosshairs of, of all the water. Um, so in addition, there were several other communities up there. Um, Patterson was the most populated area with the, the, the densely, um, the, the community along the river there. Uh, they needed the greatest assistance. So I had some experience, you know, dealing with floods on a, on a large scale. So when, when Sandy was coming, when Sandy was approaching the coast. Uh, we were looking at it coming to the Delaware River initially, the, the eye of the storm. Uh, so we knew being on a northeast quadrant that this is going to be bad for us. The Atlantic City was going to be experiencing uh, potentially, you know, five to eight feet of inundating floodwaters of a surge. You know, the surge is going to be pretty, pretty serious. Um, so we started preparing for Sandy a week out. Do you think that was enough time? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, I, I think that uh, you need to prepare for hurricanes all year round. You know, I, I think that uh, we're getting better at it, and especially after experiencing the Superstorm Sandy, um, that we are doing things different, and we are, we're better prepared now uh, than we were in, um, um, when Superstorm Sandy hit us. When Superstorm Sandy hit us, we were activated. I was uh, with New Jersey Task Force One. The night before Sandy hit us, I worked the night work in the fire department. Um, New Jersey, I was on New Hampshire Avenue the night before at 6.30. I remember standing on New Hampshire Avenue responding to a call. Um, I think it was at the um, Ocean Terrace, which is a, a high rise there on uh, New Hampshire Avenue. And it was around 6.30 and, and it was high tide. And water was just pouring across New Hampshire Avenue, going down Gramercy. And this was the night before? The night before Sandy oh. came. This is three tides before Sandy. So I'm sitting there watching water pour over my ankles across New Hampshire Avenue, just filling up Vermont and Gramercy and where the uptown school is, that, that whole neighborhood there. And how long before that were people told to eva evacuate? Because if the night before the water was already over your ankles, how much time did people really have to evacuate from Atlantic City? They were, port they were putting warnings out uh, the day before. Uh, they were putting warnings out. They had not yet required uh, mandatory evacuation, although evacuations were taking place. Uh, they were evacuating a lot of the high rises. They were moving people to what we call shelters of last resort. Uh, people didn't want to leave. So um, Atlantic City, it was that was its first real experience of, of a mass evacuation, which we, we do have a pretty good plan in place for a mass evacuation. So the three tides before that Sunday night, uh, I knew that it was going to be bad. When, when the water was pouring into Atlantic City, such as, uh, you know, at, at the, the level, the volume and the speed that it was, um, you know, I notified, you know, told my superiors, I said, listen, we're experiencing some, some pretty serious flooding right now, and we're, we're still three tides away from, the, you know, the hurricane hitting us. Wow. Now, you, a lot of your work 
other than Atlantic City was Patterson you mentioned. Yes. Did you notice a difference in how they experience flooding as opposed to around here? Yes, the Patterson floods, the amazing thing about the the Passaic Water Basin and, and the um, elevation, you know, water and elevation uh, uh, are hand in hand. And being able to predict uh, the initial flood, they predicted it three days before it happened. The floods, the 2010 floods, we knew that the water was coming down through the uh, tributaries and through the rivers of the uh, Northeast New England area. We actually were able to get into Patterson and drive around the neighborhoods and really look at the different houses and different challenges from some of the commercial buildings and um, there was um, auto body shops and there was some um, other real sensitive areas that we knew were going to be challenging and, and it was strange but it said no this, this time tomorrow there's going to be three foot of water in the streets so uh, that was a whole different um, whole different planning process that was put into place uh, preparing for that flood now the second one with Irene, it's it's you have it's a no notice event, so uh, we responded after the flood. So uh, the the Patterson is was very similar to Atlantic City, uh, whereas the water came up very quickly. Okay. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of time to prepare for it. Uh, Superstorm Sandy, when I was uh, we had responded here with New Jersey Task Force One to assist Atlantic City, and it was Monday evening. Actually, we got here Monday afternoon the, the, after the second high tide. The second high tide was a little before noon, I believe. Um, maybe it was close to 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, that it, was, uh, it was pretty bad day. We had been assigned to evacuate uh, the Venice Park Native Association. We had a military truck and we had a, a couple Zodiac um, boats with us. We were sent on a mission to uh, assist residents in the lagoon section which is over the second bridge okay. in the Venice Park area uh, which is basically the peninsula of Atlantic City that the bay surrounds uh, um, almost uh, over 220 degrees you're on a peninsula uh, so my Superstorm Sandy story was when we were out off North Riverside Drive we, were, we had a military truck and we had just picked up a some people um, uh, some the handicapped folks who were uh, non amateur, where we had people in wheelchairs, and so we were putting them in the back, and the rain is pelting on us going sideways. Uh, we had about 31 people secured in the back wow. of this military vehicle, which was challenging. And they itself. were mostly people that had yes, wheelchairs. These, yes, these were people who um, were needed assistance in getting out of their homes, and, and we were out there and we were helping them. And we were on the uh, North Riverside Drive. And our truck was already full with people. We couldn't fit anyone else in there. And uh, over the radio, my uh, my commanders were telling me we need to report back because it's dark now, and the eye of the storm was approaching. And when the eye of the storm approaches, you could experience an inundation, you know, three to five feet of water. So we're out on the, the furthest northest point of Atlantic City, and as we're coming down the street, uh, there's no power, no electricity. We couldn't see the roads. Uh, our military vehicle was literally driving over people's lawns. Um, and so there were 31 people that you picked up. How many of you were there? There were six of us. Okay. There were six of us in the vehicle. And um, as, as we were driving down North Riverside Drive, um, I was telling the driver, we have to go back now. We need to leave now. We cannot pick up. And there's people, literally, we could hear them screaming down the street for help. Flashlights mm -hmm. were being shown. And, and I, I was told my driver, we have to get back to the first bridge. Where or else you would be abandoned. Right. We, we were anticipating a surge. So I reached, uh, or I turned over to the rear and told one of my guys, you know, who has the rope? Who has our rope rescue bag? So uh, one guy, Billy, says, I have it. I said, Billy, get the rope ready because if we start floating, we're going to need to tie around something. We're going to need to tie around a pole or something because I'm. We're expecting this water surge to happen. And this is a military vehicle. This is a military vehicle because what had happened is the water had risen probably 12, 16 inches within that 30 minutes that we were out there. And I was watching it and I knew it was coming. And we were telling us on the radio that the eye was approaching. So I was concerned about everybody's safety in that vehicle. So we were, we were trying to plan for if something the worst would happen. So I was telling everybody we're heading back and they're yelling at me. There's people still yelling in the. In the 
in the neighborhoods and said, hey, I So next thing I hear is somebody jumps out of the vehicle. So one of my guys jumps out of the vehicle and runs towards one of the homes. So First responder instincts, right? He runs towards <laughs> one of the homes. So I have our driver turn around, turn around, said we have to go back and, and get him. So he turned around, he was back. He had seen three little boys standing in about two feet of water on their front door, a mother and three boys. So he went over and he grabbed them and scooped them up. And as we turned around, we were able to throw them into the back of the vehicle. And um, we were able to, as we could see the water rising and, and out of you know, the grace of God, it was a miracle that um, I didn't know it at the time, but the eye did shift. The eye shifted north where the eye came directly towards Atlantic City. So our um, eye wall inundation wasn't as serious as it could have been and as serious as I thought it was going to be. So uh, we were very fortunate that the eye did shift. And uh, so we were able to get those young children and, and take them to safety. Wow. But that was what I would call a uh, I'm sure a, that a is like call. the memory that you will hold on to forever. Yes, there's uh, certain visions that, that you will never, never forget. Yeah. That's definitely now, as fire chief, when you are preparing for a storm or even dealing with the aftermath of a storm, do you also work with the other departments in Atlantic City as well, like the police and public works, maybe building department? How does that work? The, uh, Atlantic City has been experiencing floods since its existence, and um, as the uh, we learn more information as technology gets better, um, as um, we grow wiser, that uh, we all work together uh, hand in hand. Uh, we've been getting uh, uh, better at it. We have better resources available to us. Um, the, the Public Works Department, uh, along with the uh, Police Department, the Health Department, are, are vital, vital departments to, to respond to emergencies or flooding emergencies, more importantly. In, in Atlantic City. And they're also a big part of the prevention. Also, our, our public works division, uh, when we look at our stormwater system, uh, of getting the water out quickly. You know, we may not be able to stop it from coming in, but when it, the tides go down, that we need to make sure that, that it, we evacuate the water rather quickly. So uh, we work hand in hand with, with our public works department, our code enforcement, our building construction department uh, is vital in an aftermath is they come out and they help us with assessments. They'll come out and we'll go house by house and block by block. And, and, and see if they're safe and things we'll like that. start looking at the degree of damage. Um, you know, working hand in hand with, with the police department as, as uh, we put together task forces to go out and assist us. We've, uh, we've been able to acquire a lot of resources over the last five years. The uh, police department and fire department with our high water vehicles. Uh, police department now has Humvees. Uh, okay. to assist as well as they also have the military personnel carriers, which are the, the five-ton vehicles. Um, we have a couple vehicles, maybe the fire department has a few. Um, so we we uh, we get better every storm is in coordinating, okay, well, if it's a police emergency, um, whether it could be uh, whatever type of incident that may involve um, you know, violence or use of force type stuff, which is a high priority incident. Mm -hmm. um, that we assist them with the vehicles. Oh, wow. If we have a fire where we're evacuating people, such as we did in Jonas in um, January of 2016, uh, they assisted us with evacuating 35 people off Virginia Avenue. So um, the team effort, we, we can't do it any other way, and uh, we're getting better at it. Each and we plan well, it does practice. take practice, and yes. even though these are tragic events that have happened, they were practice for all of us, you know, for their experience for the next time. So I'm sure, what have you learned in the ways of, you know, being better for the next time? We're constantly learning. We, we always uh, create an after-action report uh, to see what worked well, what didn't work okay. well, you know, what can we do better. Or you know what additional resources uh, can we call or, or ask for assistance? So every storm is different. You know, it's it's no one one storm. There's no one cookie cutter to say this is what we need to do every time. Um, so so we're learning. Um, whether it's um, the most important thing is to get people out of harm's way. You know whether it's it's protecting uh, life first and then property. 
Uh, so it's looking at uh, how we do our advisories, you know, how we do our notifications to people. Uh, we're getting better at that. that. That's the key is to make sure that people stay informed, make sure that they have situational awareness, um, and try to get the residents to take care of themselves is, is what we really want people to do is to have a place to go. Um, you know, have your emergency kits ready. And uh, we try to do the best job we can to give people most advance notice as we can. Um, especially with our nuisance flooding, which we're experiencing a lot, you know, uh, more often now street flooding where vehicles get that. So we're trying to let people know, you know, hey. Don't drive through it. <laughs> do not drive through it. And more importantly, move your car if you're parked in, in, in a low-lying area. If, if you know that, um, you know, it's going to flood, that you need to move your vehicle. So uh, we are getting better at that with utilizing some of our, uh, what we call our code red resources, which sends out phone calls to okay. um, specific neighborhoods. So we are targeting neighborhoods now um, and getting the word out better than Is we that have something in the past. that people can sign up for on yes. the Atlantic City website? Or? Yes, that's, a, um, uh, that's something that we want people to do. We want people to go to our website, the uh, cityofatlanticcity.org, uh, to the emergency management section, and you can uh, get. Uh, you can sign up for notifications through the code red system so there is a lot of information on that website um, in regard to knowing just knowing if you're in a flood area there's a flood inundation map on our website uh, to let people know your neighborhoods whether it's a bungalow park neighborhood or west side neighborhood um, or the venice park neighborhoods or uh, ducktown neighborhood is, is has a an area along texas along fairmont along arizona that experiences uh flooding uh, in what we call the nuisance flooding now, um, as well as our Chelsea Heights and Lower Chelsea area uh, along Winchester Avenue along the bay there. Um, we have uh, several neighborhoods that uh, we've been experiencing flooding. Now if you're watching live on Facebook, you can send in your comments or any questions. I will review them before we end the show. Uh, I think my last question for you would be, you know, if you want to let us know about what projects Atlantic City is working on um, for flood mitigation and also what you think is the greatest challenge of being a first responder on a barrier island. Okay, first, the, the Atlantic City project. Uh, it's, it's ongoing, the flood mitigation. Uh, we are looking at things like we never have before. Uh, there's been a lot of great projects that have been accomplished uh, recently. Uh, as I spoke to you about um, my, where I was standing during Superstorm Sandy on New Hampshire Avenue, that will never happen again. Uh, that project along New Hampshire Avenue, Main Avenue, if you will, the $65 million steel bulkhead and uh, jetty projects, um, that's completed. So we'll never see that water coming in like it did before. So that's a... Uh, that's one project, just one of, of over a dozen projects that we have going on. The beach replenishment project, which helped Atlantic City greatly in creating dunes. Although we have lost beach along Metropolitan, along Vermont Avenue, along Rhode Island Avenue, out in front of the Ocean uh, Resort, uh, the dunes are still there. The dunes are what's going to protect the boardwalk. So that beach replenishment project, although um, we have lost some, it's been a very successful project. The, um, the bulkheading along the back bays is a project that we're working on. We have a project on New Hampshire Avenue that we're getting ready to start. Um, the Baltic Avenue Canal project, which is uh, we're in the first of probably three or four phases. Uh, we've installed two pumps to uh, assist with removing the water out of the Atlantic City streets. Um, this is a project that's, that's new to Atlantic City. We're, we were a city that had no pumps. Um, within two years, we're probably going to have eight pumps working in the city. So uh, the current two pumps that are working off of Rhode Island Avenue now um, assist us with removing rainwater. Uh, it's been challenging. We have pumps at resorts now. We have two pumps that assist uh, removing water around the uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania Avenue. And are these flood-prone areas? Or? Yes, these are areas that have been inundated by floodwaters. We have resorts. Uh, uh, we have the Port Convention Center has uh, a pump there that helps remove water around the uh, Boardwalk Hall area. Uh, Massachusetts Avenue, uh, which is one of the um, very high-risk areas right now, we're going to have a pump installed there also. So we went from a city of no pumps to we're going to be a city of pumps. 
so we have a big learning curve ahead of us there. What the biggest thing people could do for is to raise their houses. You know, to protect property, we would ask you know, residents to please uh, take a very serious look at elevating your homes if you live in a flood prone area. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, I mean, we don't really have any questions on Facebook. Apparently we're sideways, so you can flip your phone if we're sideways. Um, some people say congratulations to Dan and Amanda. I think that's all. We must have answered everyone's questions before they had a chance to ask. Great. So, <laughs> so our biggest challenge, I, I can just add a little bit to, to the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest challenge is, is getting people educated, you know, getting the community educated, and, and we're, uh, we're getting better at that. You know, we want people to, to understand, uh, first of all, uh, what flood waters can do to your home, how it damages property, and you know how quickly that you could be in trouble. Whether if your power gets cut off, if your gas gets cut off, if the roadways get cut off, there's no way um, for you to evacuate. So we want people to understand that. That listen, you you, you need to take uh, responsibility and evacuate when when the authorities request you to evacuate, and just be prepared. You know, having your your, your kits, your home evac, your uh, home emergency kits. So, you know, all that information can be provided on the website, on okay. the cityconnectcity.org with uh, emergency management. So uh, that's, that's our biggest challenge, along with some uh, very expensive projects in the city. Uh, but I think if we can let the people know, you know, what's going on ahead of time, get the information out there quicker. So if uh, you are a resident or a visitor of Atlantic City, you should check out their website and also sign up for their emergency for notification red. system this way you could always be informed if there is a storm coming right. right best thing you can do well thank you for joining us tonight uh the irish pub and the coalition would like to present you with your second irish pub t-shirt <laughs> so <laughs> great <laughs> thank, thank you, you again and i don't believe we'll be here next sunday because it is uh saint patrick's day so we'll keep you updated on that. Um, I think it will just be Dan Skeldon doing an update next week. So it's just me tonight and then just Dan next week. But thank you again for watching. Have a nice night.